here. Um, obviously, David James will be speaking here in a minute. But I really want to send a, a thanks to John White from the Office of Development for helping us get this, uh, get this distinguished speaker here tonight. I um, also want to thank Deb Snyder, our administrative assistant in our office, for all of you students who will be soon sending us information about all your internships. If they don't fly muster with her, you're not getting to your internship. So uh, thank you, Deb, for everything you've done. Um, the Weckworth Lecture, for those of you who don't know, uh, was started by our own Professor Corsi about 24 years ago. And the, the goal of this lecture is to honor Chick Weckworth, who was the first chair of the uh, Recreation Department. And Chick had a, a, a wonderful legacy of service to recreation, and subsequently, this is a big part of uh, our department in terms of sport as well. Um, tonight, David James is here to talk about uh, s social impact. What does that mean as good business? And we'll, we'll find out a little bit more about that as we go along. Um, David has uh, had 15 years working in the youth sport uh, industry. He's a native of uh, Williamsport, for all you baseball folks. Anybody know what Williamsport is famous for? Little League what? There we go. So this is the gentleman who has worked in Little League uh, baseball from pretty much almost your entire career, your working career, I think is what you said earlier today. Um, he's uh, worked as our e the Eastern Regional Assistant Director as well as the Director of Urban Initiatives and Challenge Programs uh, through 2008. At that point, he joined Major League Baseball and when they started their play ball initiative, uh, David became the senior director of the RBI program, which is designed to increase participation of baseball and softball in underserved communities to promote greater inclusion of minorities in sport. You're going to hear an awful lot about this term, underserved. Now, when I ask all students to think about this, what does it mean to serve an underserved community? And I would like you to also think about <coughs> expanding that definition as far as you can take it. Because what David is going to talk about tonight is something I know most of you walk in and say, I want to work in baseball. A lot of you will say, I want to work in baseball. I love baseball. By the way, don't use that term love. But you want to look, you want to work in baseball. That's great. But operations is not the only opportunity out there. And how can you serve the sport? by doing some of the things that David will talk about tonight. So I encourage you to expand your thinking, expand your opportunities, think about what it means to serve, and after tonight, engage with your faculty in terms of what does it mean? And how can we extend the humanist mission a little bit further through sport? So I want to welcome David James to the podium, where I'm sure you're here to hear him, not me. Thanks. Good evening, everyone. Uh, honored uh, to be here. Learned a little bit uh, last evening uh, about uh, this particular series and what it means to this college. So uh, very honored to be here. I uh, want to give special thanks to John White, Dr. McAllister. Um, it's been a pleasure working with them, uh, not only on this event, but uh, the play ball event that we did last year, a lot of meetings here uh, during this visit about uh, what you guys can do here at Springfield College to impact the community and reach out to kids and, and get them involved in what I believe is the greatest game, both baseball and softball. Um, I get a lot of opportunities to uh, do presentations across the country throughout the season. And uh, recently, uh, we did a tour of uh, the Southwest uh, promoting RBI uh, right after the first of the year. And I was doing one of the presentations, and afterwards, uh, 
there was a representative from one of the leagues who came up and talked to me, uh, an older woman, and she came up to me and she said, David, does, uh, has anybody ever told you that you're a really good public speaker? And I said, no, ma'am, I, I really don't hear that. And she looked at me and she said, then why do you keep talking? It's <laughs> one of the experts. <laughs> um, so, uh, as he said, as, as uh, Kevin said, I've been very fortunate. Uh, grew up in Williamsport, Pennsylvania, home of Little League. Uh, when I was a kid, every summer, um, we would trek across the bridge, the Susquehanna River, the bridge that covered the Susquehanna River, and we'd go over for, you know, uh, it, before they expanded it, it was about seven or eight days, and it was baseball heaven. And you had uh, ABC, Wide World of Sports, and you got to meet a lot of celebrities, and we ran around and we slid down the hill. Uh, but what was interesting for me, I wasn't and never have been a very good baseball player. But as a result of growing up there, it was sort of ingrained uh, in my DNA. Um, I had uh, every design to be a sports broadcaster. Loved the game, loved the sport. Listened to a lot of AM radio on Wingsport, Pennsylvania. You could get uh, 660 The Fan, and I know I'm in New England, so I listened to a lot of Yankees games and was a Yankees fan. Uh, but I played Little League. I played till I was about 14 years old, but I was never any good. But I still love the game. I had, you know, a few experiences playing where, you know, all of the stars aligned and I got a hit or I made it an incredible catch. Um, and sometimes it was tough with the kids in the neighborhood, you know, kids were brutal. Uh, and uh, from my Little League career, I was the kid who played the minimum. Uh, basically, six defensive outs and one at bat, but I loved the game and was have been very fortunate to find ways to stay involved with it. As I said, I was a mass communications major in college, was doing radio, and then a gentleman that uh, grew up on the same block that I did, uh, and his older sisters used to babysit me, and he reached out and he said, David, we've got a job in Bristol, Connecticut, um, assistant director of the East Region. Uh, for Little League at the uh, A. Bartlett Giamatti Training Center, who was a former commissioner of uh, Major League Baseball. And so I took the job, and my life changed uh, forever. Uh, a couple of infamous claims to fame uh, that I had, um, I was intimately involved with uh, Danny Almonte. Uh, many of you may remember that. He was the young man that pitched a perfect game at the Little League World Series. And unfortunately, afterwards, we found out uh, that he was too old to play. Um, and a little bit of uh, irony with that, not necessarily in a good way, that took place in August of 2001. Uh, so Sports Illustrated showed up at Little League. They had the original birth certificate. They had lost to Apopka, Florida in the U.S. semifinals. And in the audience that particular day was President George W. Bush and also Tom Ridge, who at the time was the uh, governor of Pennsylvania. Um, so the, the Tuesday after, um, a bunch of us got called into the boardroom with Steve Keener, the president and CEO of Little League. And uh, he said, there's reporters here uh, from the New York Times. And he said, they're gonna do a big piece about Danny Almonte and how did it get to this point. Um, and you know, Steve had already made some comments and some statements and he said, some of you in the room, they're gonna wanna talk to you specifically uh, just because of the experiences at the regional tournament in Bristol and things like that. And I was one of those people um, I argued with a uh, coach and a team from Quantic, New Jersey, um, that had early on had said, he's too old, he's too old, he's too old. And at the time, I thought it was really driven by racism um, because here's this team of uh, you know Hispanic kids from the Bronx, New York City, and we had seen a birth certificate with a raised seal. So Steve sort of gave the pep talk to everybody from the staff and said, we're gonna get through this. During the course of that, um, 
suddenly someone came and knocked on the door uh, while we were in the conference room. And Steve said, come on in. And uh, it was one of the secretaries, and she said, turn on the TV. That was Tuesday, September the 11th. And as we all know, the world changed that day. And uh, obviously the story uh, never got written in New York Times. And I tell you that story uh, from the standpoint, it's just a game. It, it's really what it is. It's, it's about fun. It's about kids enjoying regardless of their ability. Again, I call out. I wasn't a good player, but I love the game. And I think that's a good way to sort of start off um, where we are now from a standpoint of Major League Baseball. And what you see here is logos of all of the programming that Major League Baseball offers. Uh, I was uh, telling these guys, uh, the end of the year after the World Series, typically into the first of the year, this year it's been a little bit longer, we do what I call presentation season. So you're doing a lot of uh, opportunities like this where you're explaining your programming, you're talking about your impact. And as our department has grown to baseball and softball development, when I started to put together our decks for this year's presentations, he said, man, it's too wordy. And how do I get the messaging out? And I decided to put logos up. And when I put it up there, I was like, wow, this is, uh, this is pretty impressive in regards to the work uh, that has been established. And it's all underneath the umbrella of play ball. And as you see here on the slide, it says, however you play ball, play ball. And through some of the partners here, we believe that there is a life cycle here uh, for kids and communities to engage both in the games of baseball and softball. And this past spring, uh, I want to say March, April, um, we used to be called Youth Programs. And there were some changes to our department. There were some additions added to it. And our name changed to Baseball and Softball Development. And it was surprising the number of people who would come up to us and other members of our team and staff and go, you guys say softball. Absolutely, we say softball. The girls are just as important to us as the boys are. Their sport is important to us. And as you see the logo of USA Baseball and USA Softball on there, they are the governing bodies. Uh, and for those that aren't aware, in 2020, baseball and softball is back on the Olympic menu, uh, which is really important for us for this particular industry as it relates to stick and ball. USA Softball has already qualified for the 2020 Olympics. Uh, USA Baseball begins the process this coming summer. I was mentioning earlier in some of the other presentations, uh, USA Baseball got a tough draw uh, during the Americas. So Cuba, Puerto Rico, Dominican Republic, Venezuela. Uh, now, it does seem like the Olympic Committee really wanted us in there because USA Baseball has three opportunities to qualify. Um, but, you know, it, it's going to be, it's not going to be easy. Um, no major league players uh, on the baseball side. It can be collegiate players and non-major league rostered minor league players that can compete uh, for Team USA. So we're keeping our fingers crossed for them. What's interesting about this is we're back on for Tokyo. The next Summer Olympics is Paris, and baseball and softball is not on the menu at this time for Paris. And then after that, we're back here in the States for LA. So there's gonna be a big push within the industry to make sure that both teams are successful, um, that we get a lot of viewership and there's a lot of enthusiasm. So hopefully we can have a three year, I should say a three cycle, uh, Olympic cycle, of uh, both baseball and softball uh, being back in the Olympics. So that's really important to us. But as the governing bodies, uh, they are our partners in all things that we do. Uh, they are the tentpole partners of Play Ball. So you see their logo under, their logos underneath the overall Play Ball logo. You also see minor league baseball in this also, that there are partners. Quite honestly, minor league baseball has a bigger reach than major league baseball. 162 minor league clubs across the country. Uh, from a major league perspective, we're only 30. So they're very important with us in this also. Um, also call out, uh, it was mentioned, uh, RBI, Reviving Baseball in Inner Cities, and we'll talk a little bit about that uh, 
later on. Um, that is one of the cornerstone programs of Major League Baseball, focusing on providing opportunities to play for underserved kids in underserved communities. Uh, you'll also see across the top here some logos. It's hard to see with this resolution. Um, Major League Baseball and its clubs, we now have 10 youth academies in different locations across the country. A number of them are being operated by the Major League clubs. We operate uh, two of them, one in New Orleans, Louisiana, another one in Compton, California. These are brick and mortar facilities where at no cost, young men and women have the opportunity to come and play baseball and softball. Most of these academies and locations across the country are also providing educational resources, things as financial literacy, SAT, SAT ACT training. Um, New Orleans and Compton specifically have pretty extensive broadcast journalism programs. Uh, New Orleans, in conjunction with Tulane, has a sports law program also. Um, and when I hear about some of these programs that they're doing, I think of kids like me, again, may not necessarily be able to secure a college scholarship, but the game is providing other opportunities to these kids, and more importantly, providing opportunities to these, these communities. Now, there are a couple of them that are called urban youth academies, and that's uh, contractually based upon the communities that they're working in. One of the most recent ones is in Kansas City um, that the Royals funded and helped build, and that is located in Kansas City in their historically African-American community, and it's a stone's throw away from uh, the Negro League Museum, so they felt it was very important to keep the urban tag on that one. But in other markets, um, they don't want to use the term urban because they want to open it up to everyone to be able to come and to participate in the, in the play. But the location of these academies is important to make sure that the underserved kids, the underserved communities, that they have easy access to it, that they're able to walk to it or walk their bicycle, things like that. Additionally, as we sort of uh, undertook this in, in how do we grow the game, uh, let me just show of hands how many baseball, softball players here in the room. There's been a lot of discussion about the game and becoming too expensive. Baseball and softball has become too expensive. Um, I am a big believer the game's not expensive. Travel is expensive. And I think uh, the, the surge of travel ball uh, came about as a result of parents, coaches, um, wanting to compete at a higher level, which is okay, uh, but sometimes talent is in the eye of the beholder, and I think part of what happened is if that beholder was a parent and they had the resources, they were a little bit blind on the ability that their child may have, but they had the money and the resources, and so we're going to go play somewhere else where I believe my son, my daughter is going to get more opportunities to play, which isn't always necessarily the case. But that all came at, to the detriment of community-based baseball and softball leagues. And so uh, you see a lot of uh, declining participation um, with a lot of the national member organizations, whether it be Little League, Babe Ruth, Pony, Dixie, yeah, even American Legion is seeing some of that, and American Legion primarily focuses on the older age group and ties into high school baseball teams. And so uh, RBI started before that, but RBI and other efforts from a Major League Baseball perspective, they said, how do we turn this around? And most importantly, how do we provide baseball and softball opportunities for everyone, regardless of their playing opportunities? So Major League Baseball, along with USA Baseball and USA Softball, undertook a couple of initiatives. One of the ones that I'll call out the entry level um, for kids, and it doesn't necessarily matter what your playing abilities is, you'll see at the bottom the logos of two of our skills competition, pitch and run and junior home run derby. Those are skills competitions, which focuses on some of the basic tenets of the game. Obviously, the pitch and run competition, as the name is called, um, it's a competition to pitch, to hit, and to run. And you get an opportunity to compete at a local level. If you advance out of the local competition, then you get to go to one of the 30 team championships 
that take place in all of the major league markets. If you happen to win coming out of that, then uh, your scores are compared against uh, other kids from across the country. And if you get the higher scores, then you get to go to the All-Star Game and compete for a national championship. Again, for those kids that make it to the national championship, regardless of how they do, it's an experience of a lifetime. You're on a plane, you're on the field at the major league market, you get those types of opportunities. Junior Home Run Derby is relatively new. Um, you know, kids, and they say chicks, love the long ball, love to hit home runs. Uh, and even though I sort of disagree, we were talking earlier, I think the game has sort of evolved to strikeouts and home runs, but this is an opportunity to sort of feed that appetite for kids to be able to go up and hit it as long as they can. And again, there's a competition component to it where you have the opportunity to advance um, all the way to the All-Star game. And it gives uh, uh, you know, regular kids and fans, regardless of their ability, a once in a lifetime opportunity. Also, you'll see a logo here for a program called Fun At Bat. Um, this is USA Baseball's version, different version of T-Ball. Um, if any of you have ever been to a T-Ball game at a local youth league, it is the swarm. Um, a lot of times it's a, a parent who did not play baseball or softball, but they want to sign their child up for a league, so they sign up. Um, they're asked to coach. They really don't know much about the game. And we have to hope that they have a wonderful experience and they become lifelong fans. The problem with that, T-ball really hasn't evolved over the last 20 or 30 years. So those of you that play baseball or softball, you're familiar, they use a standard T. More often than not, they use a regulation <coughs> ball, which is a hard ball. And even though they have smaller bats at four, five, six years old, they're hitting with an aluminum bat that they've probably never swung before, and there's a lot of other kids, it's a little bit dangerous. USA Baseball as the governing body did a lot of research, and ultimately they came back and said that T-ball is hurting our sport. That is the first moment of entry for a lot of kids and communities. They don't have a good experience, and they walk away from the game at five or six years old, and I see Coach back there, he may see a kid a little bit later on that looks like he has some talent and he say, hey, young man, young lady, why aren't you playing baseball or softball? Nah, I had a really bad experience in T-ball. And they walk away from the game. So USA Baseball worked with Franklin Sports, which is based uh, not too far from here, up in Boston, and they developed a different version of a T, which has a much larger cup. Um, they use plastic or foam bat balls and uh, the balls, uh, I, I talk a lot that if you go to a Walmart and you go in the sporting goods section and you see those big multicolored plastic or foam balls, those are the types of balls that they use for fun at bat. What that does is that guarantees success for these kids. They're swinging the bat, they're making contact, they're running. The kids who are playing the field, now there's a ball that they're not scared of and they can catch. And then USA Baseball also the short in the season. So a fun at bat season is only six weeks long. And each week has a theme to it. Um, uh, sportsmanship, teamwork, loyalty. So they're taking something educationally away from it also. And then the most brilliant thing that I think USA Baseball did with this is there was a lot of pushback again among some of the other national member organizations. We've always done team. That's a division of play for us. So there was pushback. USA Baseball partnered with an organization called Shape America. And Shape America works with school districts across the country and helps them develop their physical education curriculums. Um, so this past year in 2018, over a million kids did fun at bat in their uh, PE classes, in their kindergarten, in their schools, and things like that. So what we expect from that is that there's going to be a lot of kids who weren't involved in the game, that they go home and they say, Mom, Dad, you know, we did baseball, we did softball through fun at bat uh, in gym class today. And as a result of that, you know, uh, they're familiar with it and they say, I want to play in our local league, and that's how we grow the game. Um, you'll see here some of our sponsors, Chevrolet, Scott's, Kingsford, um, that support us and, and make sure that we have opportunities to get these play ball events out to as many as possible. And then you'll see again, as I mentioned, some of the other things that we're doing, working with the NCAA. Um, we have uh, MLB4, which is coming up in just a couple of weeks. It's a collegiate tournament. 
that's taking place in Arizona, Vanderbilt, uh, TCU, there's a few other schools that are playing in that one. Um, we also do, uh, you'll see a little bit here for states play. Last year we did this at Globe Life in Arlington, and that was Texas and California. Uh, the best players from both states uh, play the tournament this year. It will take place in Miami, and it will be Florida and Georgia. Um, so baseball is really being aggressive and operating in this particular space and making sure that everybody has opportunities to play. So what is the impact of all of this with play ball? And uh, in 2018, all 30 major league clubs and 15 minor league clubs held play ball events in their respective markets. Um, another partner of play ball is the United States Conference of Mayors. And the importance of the Conference of Mayors can't be overstated. In most cities across the country, the mayors also control the Park and Recreation Department which most importantly means they control the fields and they control access to the fields. So as a result of their endorsement of the play ball campaign, what they're also doing is providing access, especially to underserved kids, underserved communities. They don't have to worry about paying the permit fees or having to pay for the lights. Um, there have been issues across the country in some times of economic distress where park and recreation departments tend to give the permits to organizations that can afford to pay. Uh, so you'll see a lot of adult recreation leagues or other for-profit entities that don't have any problems paying for the lights, paying for the permits, and so they get first choice. As a result of the Conference of Mayors, that's giving kids more access uh, to the game and giving them more opportunities to play. Play ball events take place all across the country, and we have some opportunities to do some very unique events. So here's an example of, that, of something that we did this past spring. Second consecutive year, baseball and softball combined to rank 
as the most participated team sports in the United States in 2017 with over 25.1 million participa uh, participants. In 2017, casual participation in baseball rose by 12.9%, with overall participation seeing a six-point uh, increase. And over the last three years, baseball has seen a 49% growth in casual participation, which is in direct correlation to the launch of the Play Ball Initiative. And I probably should have talked about this earlier. We are very specific. These are not Play Ball clinics. These are Play Ball events. And so what it is, it is, especially with the younger kids, it is organized recess. It is not your standard station to station. This is how you throw, this is how you catch, this is how you bat. We do home run derby with plastic and foam bat balls and we tell the kids when you hit a home run, flip your bat, have fun, trot around, trot around the bases. We do games of catch. We do a game of bat and ball, and the reason we do that, Wiffle Ball is a brand. I know everybody's familiar with Wiffle Ball, and we tried to talk to them and convince them to come on board, and it was pretty expensive, so we call it a game of, a, a game of play ball. But we really talk about casual participation, and at these play ball events, we really want to focus on getting kids in who currently aren't playing the game. So we go to a lot of different markets where we know there's not a lot of participation and we do these play ball events and you see a lot of kids who have never held a bat before and aren't holding it the right way. I think we saw a lot of that here in Springfield and you show them the proper way to hold the bat, the proper way to swing and they have success and they're not scared of the ball because it's a foam or a plastic bat and ball. And we're hopeful and we're starting to see by some of this data as a result of that, and we give them that bat and ball set when they go home, that they say, hey, mom, dad, I want to sign up. I want to go play in the league. Um, our website is playball.org, and on there, there is, I call it an app, but it's a link, really, uh, and it's called Playball Near You. And what you can do there is you can put in your zip code, and then it shows you all of the particular youth leagues in your respective area. So that gives you an opportunity, uh, you know, a means to be able to sign up and play in a league. Now, all of that work doesn't necessarily apply in some markets, and it requires a little bit of extra work. And that's the purpose of the RBI program. Um, it stands for Reviving Baseball in Inner Cities, which has been a little bit of a challenge for us over the last couple of years because as many of you know, a lot of the large metropolitan areas uh, across the country have changed significantly. Um, that, you know, a lot of high rises, condos, things like that are coming up. And so when you say inner city, if you go to some places like Detroit or ironically on my commute, Newark, New Jersey, uh, it is quickly passing Hoboken in Jersey City, New Jersey, as the new bedroom community of folks who work in New York City. Um, so we focus on underserved kids and underserved communities. I talked in one of the classes before, um, probably the simplest way to describe it, poor doesn't have a color. Um, so if you don't have an opportunity to play, you don't necessarily have the resources, uh, we want to welcome you into RBI. Now, in some markets across the country, we're doing a lot of work in the Deep South. I've been in Birmingham, Alabama recently doing some work there. We're focusing on the African-American market. Um, I mentioned earlier, right after the first of the year, we did a tour of the Southwest, McAllen, Corpus Christi, Albuquerque, San Antonio. We were focusing on Hispanic uh, kids in those particular communities. Um, I've uh, told uh, multiple people today, we have an RBI league in Montana. And of course, reviving baseball in inner cities in Montana. And we thought that also, but they reached out to us. We set up a phone call and there is no high school baseball in the state of Montana. Uh, median income is well below the national average. So it's hard to garner resources. If they want to play, uh, it, you know, a three, four hour drive to the next city, the next field. And we talked about it. They are underserved as it relates to the opportunity to play baseball. And therefore, 
if they're not playing, how can they be fans of the game if they didn't have the opportunity to experience it? Um, we have uh, just over uh, 200 leagues so far this year. Uh, we expect to be over 175,000 plus. And what makes us different, and this is no disrespect to the, any of the other organizations, but we are the only national baseball and softball organization that you don't have to pay us to affiliate. You don't pay us any franchise fee. It is free to be involved in RBI. Uh, what we will also do is provide you equipment and uniforms. Uh, we talk a lot about we want to help our leagues reduce the cost of playing the game. We do do some cash grants, but uh, we're, we're in a little bit of a dilemma in regards to uh, the adage that if you do for one, you have to do for all. Um, RBI leagues are broken up into three buckets. Uh, the first bucket I call out is the major league clubs and the minor league clubs. All 30 major league clubs support RBI leagues, but there are 25 leagues uh, that are the league directors, and they're serving big numbers. I, I always call out Dodgers RBI. Uh, Dodgers RBI is 12, excuse me, 12,000 kids strong, and it is $25 a kid. Every kid gets a Dodgers home and away jersey. Uh, they're playing games, they're going to camps and clinics. And sort of the theme of this, it's good business for the Dodgers. As a result of this access for these kids, as a result of the access to the brand, uh, they are more apt now to consume Dodgers baseball too in the course of the season, to buy the apparel, to say to mom and dad, I wanna go to a game. Um, there's a lot of discussion about registration fees within RBI leagues, and what we basically say uh, to these programs is we understand that in some markets, you may not necessarily have the ability to get the local bank, the local lawyer's office to sponsor your program, so you have to charge a registration fee from a budgeting perspective. But we ask that you make sure that for those kids and those families who can't afford it, that you sign them up regardless. But if you're going to be charging, make sure you're not charging more than the market can bear. So the conversation with the Dodgers is they charge $25 because they want some skin in the game from these families and these communities. And we see this, it's the old adage that, you know, it's a single mother and she scraped up $25 for her son or daughter to be able to play but it's practice and they don't want to go to practice. And mom's going to probably tend to say, young man, young lady, that was 25 hard earned dollars. You're going to practice today. So they have an investment in it. The second group of leagues that uh, operate RBI programs are those that are operating under the umbrella of an existing organization. So that's boys and girls clubs, uh, park and recreation departments, and what is trending for us is school districts. Uh, from the standpoint that in some cities across the country, the high school baseball or softball program dissipated, and so they're using RBI as programming to jumpstart that program in their respective community. And then that third bucket is uh, independent leagues, and we lovingly call them mom and pop leagues, meaning that it's folks who have full-time jobs and they wanna make an impact in their particular community, and they're out there on a daily basis providing opportunities for kids to play. So it, it, sometimes it's a challenge balancing all of those uh, particular groups, but most importantly, what these organizations and our partners in this have shown us uh, about that adage and the conversation about those kids, those communities, don't necessarily play the game. And I think that they've proven that that's not necessarily the case. It's about access and it's about reasonable access. So we're really excited about the work that we're doing there, both for baseball and softball. Uh, another important piece for us is girls and women's opportunities. Um, I've mentioned uh, to some of you here uh, during my visit, I've been very fortunate over the last three or four years that I got to experience firsthand the phenomenon called Monet and uh, got to see her play multiple times. Uh, the Philadelphia RBI team won the junior division uh, back in 2016. They won the World Series. Monet was on that team. It was a little bit of a rematch of Philadelphia and Chicago. And uh, she's one heck of a ball player. 
Um, she was recently in the New York Times right before Christmas. She has accepted a softball scholarship to Hampton University. Now, my first reaction is the softball landscape is going to hate on her a little bit because she didn't play softball, she played baseball. Uh, but Monet had some experiences barnstorming uh, at her time in Philadelphia uh, playing baseball that uh, she really wanted to go to an HBCU. And uh, if you remember Monet, uh, at the height of her fame, there was a lot of talk that she wanted to be the point guard at UConn. Uh, but height-wise, she didn't grow that much, but she played a lot of AAU basketball. And in the article in the Times, she clearly called out uh, that she didn't enjoy the travel experience on the basketball side, and she called out the great experiences that she had playing baseball and decided to stay in our industry. So we're all rooting for her. She did say that she wants to be a broadcaster. So I've been the first one to uh, champion that we better hire her. She better work on the MLB network or shame on us if we don't do that. But uh, Monet actually caused us to rethink uh, some of the work that we're doing in the girls and women's space. And so uh, over the last, this will be the fourth year, that we're doing a number of events uh, providing opportunities for girls that want to play baseball. Um, annually in Los Angeles, usually in conjunction with Jackie Robinson Day, uh, we do the Trailblazers Tournament, and that is a, an event uh, for 11 and 12 year old girls, baseball players, Major League Baseball covers all of the expenses, and those young ladies are flown out to Los Angeles, they get an opportunity uh, to visit Dodger Stadium, uh, we do a lot of educational pieces. Sharon Robinson, the daughter of Jackie Robinson, uh, typically will come out and talk to them about uh, how they're being trailblazers like her father Jackie was. Um, and some of the successes with that and girls who wanted to continue to play, uh, last year was the first time that we will be doing it again this year, is uh, the girls and women's baseball trailblazers. So that is for basically 14 through 18 year old girls, they're playing on the big diamond. It's uh, real competitive uh, baseball. It is a showcase type event um, that we're hopeful uh, more colleges will step up and give opportunities for young ladies to play. Uh, the National Federation of High School Sports, this year is the first year the high school baseball rule book is gender neutral. Uh, because the Federation sees that there are more ladies that want to play baseball. Also, the work that we do on the softball side, you'll see Jenny Finch, the picture of Jenny up there. Uh, Jenny is our youth softball ambassador, and we're also doing these development type events, the higher end events uh, uh, for girls that are recommended through the RBI program, giving these young ladies an opportunity to also pursue um, uh, college scholarships and things like that on softball that also significantly impacts uh, the commissioner's mandate that we do more on diversity and inclusion, um, that the uh, employees of our clubs and the work that we do out of the commissioner's office is representative of what society looks like and we give more kids and ladies opportunities to uh, pursue careers in Major League Baseball regardless of whether it's something that they do on the field that there are career opportunities for them off the field. And we've got another video to show uh, regarding one of the events that we did uh, this past year in Los Angeles.
during pregame festivities before the Dodgers took on the Padres. I'll tell you what, that's not a bad way to spend your Saturday. It's aspirational, inspirational. You want to see yourself reflected in the sport. That's consistent with everything that we're doing at Major League Baseball with regards to diversity and inclusion. It's not a nice to have. It's about our value system, and we want to make sure our fans, our players, our young athletes see themselves in the entire spectrum of baseball. And that includes in behind the scenes and offices and people doing the work to make sure that the product that you see on the field is just as reflective of everything that they're trying to do as well. My hope is that it's not so common to say I'm the only woman in blank, whatever that blank is, um, and that it's not as much of a surprise when you see a woman in charge of whatever they're in charge of. Um, I think we're definitely getting to that place where women are in bigger positions of power, and I love seeing that. They were telling us how to be confident women, how to be a good hard worker, and just how to you know live life good as a woman, as an athlete too. Be confident around a male-dominated sport and do what needs to be best. Since we're from Alaska, we don't have opportunities like this, so it's super cool to see our like favorite sport in real life. This is very unbelievable. I've never thought I'd be in Los Angeles, especially on the Dodge Field, because I've never been to California, and it's just very exciting, and I'm very blessed. And you can see the enthusiasm from those young ladies for the experience. So what does all of this mean? What's the impact? Um, over a million kids impacted. And that's up a little bit like 2.5% from the year before. You see there on the grid, it sort of shows you the number of events that we do, um, whether it be RBI tournaments, RBI participation, um, the, the events like Pitch It and Run and Junior Homer Derby, the US Conference of Mayors, the game development events, um, I talk a lot, and I say this with much respect, uh, Commissioner Manfred is clinical uh, in, in regards to uh, the work that we're doing, and it's all about growing the game. And he is a firm believer that uh, we are going to grow the game and we're going to get younger by making sure kids have an opportunity to play the game. And again, using me as an example, regardless of your playing ability, if you enjoy the game, you bond in your community, um, you uh, are able to establish a mentorship relationship with your coach or uh, an individual that runs your particular league in the program, uh, then you're gonna have uh, you know, more ties to the game and you'll wanna consume the product and things like that. Uh, it's a really exciting time. Uh, I, you'll hear about more things that are coming up. They're, they're really thinking outside the box uh, in regards to where we take the game in places that are very unique. So, um, would open it up to any questions that anybody has? I'm not that good, really. <laughs> <laughs> Step off, please. Say your name and uh, what year you are. Uh, I'm Danny, I'm a sophomore. Um, so when you're talking about the uh, like percentages and the numbers of like people that you reach through RBI and other programs, um, it was just such a high, high number that was surprising to me. Um, is that like that they go on their own choice, or is it like a thing that they're like sort of forced? No, um, it, it's, it's obviously voluntary. Um, it, you don't have to play. Um, I mentioned earlier about there was a lot, there's been a lot of discussion over the last five to 10 years, uh, specifically as it relates to the African American community, that they don't play baseball and softball. And we fervently believe that's not the case. It, it's about access. And there was a lot of conversation in the moment Springfield Mass. Well, they're all playing basketball. Uh, basketball, you know, a lot of times you can play much more informally, and all you need is a court in basketball. So, uh, you know, to the credit of Major League Baseball and the leadership is that resources were put in place to make sure that we can reduce the cost of playing the game. One of the things that we're also pushing from an RBI perspective is 
not tournament teams. The kids that are on tournament teams, we don't have to chase them. They're already playing. It's the other kids that we want to give opportunities and play more regular season games and give opportunities to the young man, the young lady that doesn't know if they're any good yet. And what we found is if you give them that opportunity, they will play. The other misconception out there too uh, about the youth baseball landscape, it is a spring sport. Even here in the Northeast where folks get started earlier, if you take a look at it, most of youth baseball leagues, the regular seasons are done before Memorial Day. And then those leagues focus on teams of 15 players that are the all-star players who are the kids who are good and already playing. One of the things that we've done with RBI, we push our season later so that when kids are out of school during the course of the summer, they have more opportunities to play. And, and if the better kids are playing all-star, that's fine also, but for the kids who aren't that good, that gives them more opportunities to play with no pressure. You're welcome. to make sure that our leadership, uh, whether it be at the club level, out of the commissioner's office, is reflective uh, uh, of the changing demographics of the country. I mentioned the, uh, the Southwest trip, um, and uh, the Hispanic population does have an affinity for the game of baseball and softball, and when I was down there visiting those particular cities, they were already playing they had in their respective communities, they had leagues up and running, but they weren't affiliated with anybody. It was a local community-based league with no support. Now, whether that's you know part of the tenor in that part of the country and you know in the country right now, but it, it was surprising that when we went in that they were, you know, fundamentally they were established leagues. And they were a little surprised that Major League Baseball, you know, someone came down to talk to them and said, hey, we want you part of our program and you get the opportunity to use the silhouetted batter. And, you know, you can tell your kids in your community that your league is partnered with Major League Baseball. And obviously in Texas, that's an opportunity that we made some introductions both for the Rangers and the Astros. Uh, to those communities and those new leagues so that make sure that they do outreach and, and do events with the kids and give them opportunities to come to games. So it, it, it's important to stay current with uh, the trends and the demographics in the country. Yes. Hi, Megan. I'm Julia here. You were talking about the play ball Yes. Do you have future uh, plans put in place in order to gain more? Because there's like you said, 150. That's right. Mm -hmm. So, minor league baseball overall did 400 some play ball events, but a few, only a few of them branded that play ball. Uh, our department is operated under one of the nonprofits, so we're. Uh, the Major League Baseball Youth Foundation, but I work for a for-profit company. So sponsorship sells, and they sell well, as they should. So as you saw the, the one particular slide that had Chevy, Scott's, Nathan's, we're working through that with our sponsorship group um, because the minor league clubs are saying, well, can we have an opportunity to sell that also? So I think that number will increase, uh, but when we really started to reach out to minor league this year, it was sort of baby steps, but we, but we expect that number to significantly increase for this year. Yes. Hi, Mr. James. I'm Sam. I'm Junior. Um, my question, so I know you stopped playing at 14, um, and I know that's a common age where pe people stop playing because, uh, for me at least, um, the local opportunities kind of end there, and it seems like most of the travel and high school sports. So how are you looking at like that age? 
Yeah, it's, I, I think actually USA Softball plays a role in that. Um, they have some desire to help grow recreational in adult softball. Um, I'm pretty good at hitting a softball. I, I can't hit the baseball. I mentioned to a couple of the classes earlier, if any of you have ever seen the movie Major League, I'm Pedro Serrano. Uh, the <laughs> is the, the strangest thing uh, I've ever seen. Um, and if you watch those ad campaigns, the play ball, you, you see a lot of them, you know, recreational play. Um, uh, one of my colleagues who was here for the play ball event uh, that we did here last year um, has some ties to the Yankees. And uh, the Yankees for two years in a row did a stickball tournament in the Bronx underneath the L uh, train platform. And that has really taken off that that may evolve into a stickball league. Um, in the Hispanic community, there's a, cave, a game called Batia, uh, which they play down in the DR, which is basically a bottle cap. So we're always looking at different ways uh, to play the game. Somebody actually mentioned recently, you guys should do dodgeball and play ball events. I'm not sure how I feel about that yet, but, uh, but to your point, I, I think you know, however you want to get engaged uh, in the game, to the point that when I stopped playing, uh, I mentioned earlier this morning, my first job that I ever got paid for was keeping book in, in a local Little League in, in there. So I found a way to still stay involved in the game, even if it wasn't on the field. Yes? My name is Michael, I'm a junior. And uh, my question is, um, I know like if Sports now and not like nowadays, uh, players are like tending to stick with one, one sport specialization. Mm -hmm. um, with this program, are you like for specialization, or do you want kids to venture out and play more than? No, we want kids to play more than one sport. Um, we actually instituted, uh, in conjunction with USA Baseball, two years ago. There's a moratorium, so once the uh, the World Series is done. We won't run any events until Martin Luther King weekend. Uh, and then we do the Dream Series, which is a specialized camp for just pitchers and catchers. Um, but we are all for sports sampling. Uh, Major League Baseball is a membership in an organization called Project Play. Um, and all of the major sports are involved in it. Um, the NHL keeps talking to us about a joint play ball event with baseball and hockey. A lot of the motor skills are somewhat similar, more so for infielders uh, than anybody else. So the, the more the, the more sports you play, the merrier, the, the more healthy you are, and the more active, staying out of trouble. So we want kids to play more than one sport. Yes? Hi, my name's Barry. Hi, Barry. Um, I'm a sophomore. Um, when you spoke about play ball, you mentioned that it spreads across like over 110 cities. I was just wondering what the selection process for those specific cities looks like um, within your program. I think you guys mentioned you're serving underserved communities and children, but there is obviously a multitude of those. So I was just wondering what you guys look at to pick one city over another. Right. Um, the 110 cities, uh, that's the conference of mayors. Um, so. Uh, at the annual, well actually it's quarterly, uh, U.S. Conference of Mayors meeting, and they were just, they just have one in Washington, D.C. So mayors across the country make a pledge to host a play ball event in their respective cities. For us, we look at some data in regards to where we want to go. So uh, this past September, uh, the Census Bureau released uh, some new data about uh, cities over a 65,000 uh, person population that have the highest percentages of poverty. Um, city number one was Flint, Michigan. Uh, we did a play ball event in Flint two years ago, started an RBI league. They're sort of middle of the road right now. We're going back to Flint, Michigan uh, to do another play ball event and get resources to help that league grow and be sustainable. City number two was Gary, Indiana. We're going to Gary, Indiana to do a play ball event there. Latroy Hawkins, uh, uh, pitcher in the major leagues, longtime reliever, he's now an executive for the Minnesota Twins. That's where Latroy is from. Um, Little League had a strong Little League program there for years. 
in Gary, Indiana. They made it to the Little League World Series with Lloyd McClendon. Uh, LaTroy made it to Little League's uh, junior division, which is 13 to 15 year olds. Uh, so we're gonna work with Little League and some other partners there. Um, we're also targeting Richmond, Virginia, Charlotte, North Carolina, Detroit, Michigan, and that's all based upon those some of those cities that uh, showed up on that poverty ranking. We also have a desire to, within the next couple of years, to do play ball events in all 50 states. So we're having some conversations with the Red Sox because Red Sox Nation is pretty large. We haven't done play ball events yet in Maine, Vermont, and New Hampshire. We want to do that. Uh, I was talking to Kevin, uh, we're going to go to Montana. I, I have nine states to go uh, to visit every state. I actually took a pass and everybody in the office thought I was crazy. We did a play ball event in Hawaii in October. Uh, there was an all-star team that was going to Japan to play a friendly tournament and they laid over in Hawaii. So we did a play ball event there with the players, but I had gone to Alaska and I didn't want to be greedy. So <laughs> I had to pass on, on Hawaii. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think that was both questions for you. Thank you for asking that. Any other questions? Yes. My name is Mackenzie, I'm a freshman. Would RBI ever partner with like, people with disabilities? That's a very good question. And yes, um, uh, kids with special needs, kids with disabilities, they are more than welcome and open to participate. Um, we don't exclude anybody in regards to their abilities. There's been a lot of conversations as it relates to play ball events, and we had a conversation about that last night over dinner. Uh, you guys are very fortunate here with this adaptive field uh, that you partnered with the Cal Ripken Senior Foundation. Um, sort of as I mentioned, we're going to do another play ball event in Flint, Michigan. So we're going to be on a grass surface and more than likely that field is not in the best condition. Um, we know that we need to do a little bit more work in that space to make sure that they have opportunities, but we also want to make sure that we address some of the safety concerns. Um, but also being sensitive that as part of this in that particular community, uh, the kids and the parents, they want to be accepted just like everybody else, and that's important to us also. So we do do these events, but we want to make sure that we're doing them the right way to make sure it's a good experience, and first and foremost, everybody's safe. Yes. Um, I'm Joe. Hi, Joe. Uh, I was just wondering, as kind of technology advances, do you see any, like, potential to serve with, like, kids becoming more into eSports and video <coughs> <laughs> and I was asked that in one of the earlier classes. I'm probably the wrong one to ask about that because we go outside of play. And, and that's what we do. That's what we're encouraging kids to do. Um, we have MLB.com uh, that does a lot of that research, so I'm sure that we're going to get into it in some way, shape, or form. There was a young man who talked to me after the class earlier that talked about you know, online codes, and if kids come to those play ball events, they get the online codes, and that's exclusive access. But we really haven't thought about that too much because for us, it's come outside of play. Now, sort of tying into that, the other piece, though, is we are quickly moving towards an all-digital registration uh, for all of our programming. Now, there's a business application to that, um, uh, based upon some of the HIPAA laws, uh, a minor can't register themselves, so a parent or guardian has to register them for their program. And one of the uh, things that you're asked if you're a parent or guardian, it's the opt-in. And basically what that means is can Major League Baseball, or based upon the market that you're in, can the club start to market to you? So we're really pushing that, but as it relates to RBI, I used to be uh, of the belief that we have to be careful with that. I'm looking for my phone for a reason. I used to think that we have to be careful about that because there's some underserved kids and communities that they don't have access to the internet. I don't believe that anymore. Everybody has these phones now. And they have the ability to get on the Wi-Fi plans and things like that. 
And so we're not there yet. I think within the next two to three years, we will be 100% digital registration for all of the programming. And then that's an opportunity for the clubs or our office to market to these kids and communities, provide them opportunities, you know, different access that sort of tied to the esports. But at the end of the day, the work that we're going to do, we're always going to get, we're always going to encourage kids to come outside and play. Anything else? Yes. Hey, how are you? Sorry, this morning. Um, my name is Gus. I'm a freshman. Hi, Gus. So, throughout your presentation, you talked about how USA softball is important for your organization. But then you talked about how you guys are setting up events for women's baseball. Mm -hmm. So, I guess my question is would you guys rather see females play softball or baseball? We don't care. We don't care. We, we want them to play. And I don't think we're anywhere to the point that the growth in girls playing baseball is going to impact softball. If we get to that point, then we've really done a really good job. Um, you know, the landscape is going, there's a lot more work, and the landscape is going to have to change significantly that more girls are getting baseball, scholarships to play than they are softball. I think there is a good number of girls for a variety of reasons don't want to play baseball and want to play softball. I think there's a large number of girls, especially at the younger ages, maybe 13 and below, that want to play baseball, but at some point physiology is going to kick in and the boys are going to get bigger and stronger. And I think at that point, there are some girls that will go, okay, I had a nice run in baseball, but I think, you know, I use Monet as an example. She flipped over to softball now because she felt that that was the best opportunity for her and that, to get her into college. As I said, I hope we get to that problem, but I think there's a lot more work to be done in that space before we have to worry about that again. Yes, sir. Thank you, David. Springfield College has been involved for over 125 years of developing international relations with sport. And obviously as being the birthplace of basketball in the early stages. I know past baseball coaches and softball coaches here at SC have done their part to improve international relations using their sport discipline as the medium of instruction. Would you, with your play ball initiative, support sponsoring a program? And you've mentioned our upcoming competitors in terms of getting ready for baseball and the Japanese Olympics, Tokyo Olympics coming up in a couple of years. You mentioned a number of Latin American nations. Would you, as a play ball coordinator, director, vice president, support sponsoring an international initiative whereby on opening day of Major League Baseball, you identify 1,000 kids in Mexico and 1,000 kids in the US and have them toss baseballs over the Rio Grande. <laughs>
was primarily kids from Juarez. And anybody who is familiar at all with Mexico, Juarez is no joke. Um, that's the bad names down there. So um, I will go back to the office <laughs> <laughs> and I will bring your event suggestion up. <laughs> we actually have a very strong uh, RBI program there. Uh, Border Youth Athletic Association, and they're doing a lot of work to reach over into the Mexico side and giving those kids an opportunity to play. So uh, I've got some good people there. We'll talk. You never know. I may surprise you. We may pull this off. <laughs> so we may get arrested for it. But we'll <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? Well, listen, thank you all. This thank is. You. Uh,